Well, okay, hey, uh, thanks for coming. We are in 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, we'll pick up in verse 9. I was kind of aiming towards the, towards the end of the chapter. We may read through the end of the chapter and talk about a few things, but I just think I'll probably need to come back and clean some things up. There's a lot of things happening in those final verses. Uh, I'm going to pray, and then we'll, we'll get started. Father, we come to unite in the name of Jesus. We do thank you for the opportunity to look into your word. We thank you for your truth that you put before us. We do ask that our hearts would be receptive to your spirit, and to your word, to the truth. And Father, we look forward to the, the production that our lives will have as we continue to follow your truth and allow it to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Father, we again thank you for this opportunity. We pray for our nation. We pray for churches. And we ask that we may see revival and people's hearts turn towards you in these days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's go ahead in chapter uh, 1, uh, verse 1. I'm going to just read into you know verse 9 here. Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. One of the things you notice in these first verses is in the first 11 verses, and I don't think I've got it on your notes yet because I've got two sets of notes. I typed some at home, and the ones I printed off don't have some of these things on there. But uh, how many times Jesus Christ comes up in these first 11 verses? He's... He's called our Lord, our God. He's called the one that we're seeking knowledge of. So clearly, in these first 11 verses, Peter is very much Christ-centered in his Christian faith. Uh, he's, he's following the Lord. He's following God. Uh, but it's, it's through Jesus Christ. So just, you know, it's very interesting to see how... how uh, I, I'm reading a book right now about someone who's reading or explaining church history. And I've referred to it before... They're, they're, they're a non-believer. They're kind of talking about how the deity of Christ was kind of created by the church, you know, in the later centuries. But if you read this right here, uh, it's pretty clear Peter is seeking Jesus Christ, at, not just as a man representing God, but as, as God himself. Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you're saved by Christ, you're, you're in Christ, you've received faith from Christ, and now you're, you're going to grow in grace and peace if you continue to grow in knowledge of Jesus Christ. His divine will, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Again, that's Jesus Christ's glory and goodness. Through these, He's given us His very great and precious promises, Jesus Christ has given us these promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Whose divine nature? Jesus Christ's divine nature. You may participate in it also. And escape the corruption in this world caused by evil desires. And as we know, this is not a book about how to get saved. This is a book about how to grow. He's talking to believers who have been saved by Christ. Now they're trying to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, Make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, and again, that's kind of a key to how to read those, that list of character traits, they're to be increasing. Not just get this one mastered and then move to the next level, but you're going to be... Every, every little bit of faith you've got, you're going to add some knowledge, which is going to move you up to a better level of self-control, which is going to give you more of an ability to stand your ground and be hupomone, or persevering in the face of difficulties. And while you're there, you'll be able to become virtuous or godly, the godlike character traits, which lead you to brotherly kindness, lead you to agape. But at the same time, you're, you haven't maxed out. You're just building on that spectrum as you continue to spiral around. You're going to continue to add to your faith more goodness and keep growing this. So this whole thing is growing, and it says that right here in verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, as we mentioned last week, and we, we spent some time talking about con, con, okay, con, I started talking and writing at the same time. Contrasting. Uh, Peter is, is establishing knowledge and truth here in this first chapter, telling you you're going to grow and be productive. So in one sense, the true knowledge is going to cause you to grow and be productive, adding to the divine nature, or you're going to be able to participate in the divine nature. That's going to be contrast in chapter 2 with the false teaching, uh, and that's going to lead you in, back into the world, back into corruption, 
This is godliness. This is the things we've just described as you grow in this knowledge. The false teaching is going to lead you away from it. And so this is really the contrast. Peter's not, in a sense, attacking the false teacher, trying to convert the false teacher. He's trying to expose the false teacher and keep the believers over here. He's really trying to rescue the believers. He's not trying to get them saved. He's trying to keep them here instead of getting the, the, the believers over here where they're going to lead back into the worldly corruption. So if you possess these in, in increasing measure, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 9. This is where the notes begin on this page. And once again, I've got all the Greek written out up through, or, or copied and pasted, actually. I don't want to use, you know, flatter myself. Up through the end of the chapter, I will put this online. And those green letters, green numbers, are Strong's numbers. We'll click on those, and I'll take you to another website, not my website. That will give you a definition of those Greek words that, that they're representing there. So if you look on the top of page one, you can see right there the, the first words are the, you can see the omega and that looks like Y-A-P, that's actually the, the G-A-R in the Greek. It's Ho-Gar or O-Gar in the Greek, but it means but in whom. And then the next word in the Greek is me, M-A or mu, uh, Ada, and it says that would be are not. But in whom are not at hand and all these things you can see right there. So that's a nice, I like having that. You can refer back up to it and, and see where these Greek words are coming from. Uh, and what's interesting is here, and you can see the Greek, and you compare it to your translations, be it the NIV or the uh, English Standard Version. They take those words right there. Uh, look in the, the second line, the second word in the Greek, it's translated the word blind. And then the third line, it's the Strong's word, 3467, losing sight. And so in the Greek, it says blind losing sight. I mean, for that last week, blind and becoming nearsighted. If you notice in your text, most likely, and you check it yourself right now, in verse 9 it says, but if anyone does not have them, if they do not have these virtues, if they, they don't have this increasing, spiraling uh, of growing and adding to your knowledge, or adding to faith knowledge, and eventually agape coming back and adding more, spiraling up. If you are not here, then you are blind and nearsighted. And that is, the Greek says that, but the NIV and modern translations, again, I, I don't, again, the commentators I read, they say there's no reason to switch these words around. And, and do you have it, for example, I'm reading in the NIV, but if anyone does not have them, he, ha, he is nearsighted and blind. Do you understand? Is that happening to yours too? It, the nearsighted comes first and the blind comes second. It is not that way in the Greek. It's blind and nearsighted. And this could be, uh, they're probably trying to make it read m more, make sense, uh, but I think this makes fine sense. The blind would be in reference to, they are blind to this, because it's too far away. Their eyes are not working. They are not seeing the distant picture. They're not seeing that there's going to be in a day of accounting. And false teachers are going to attack certain things. They're going to attack the value of eschatology, not just the, the return of Christ and when the rapture is, if there's a rapture, all that stuff, but the things that take place. There is an age to come. We, we know something about it. We know it's going to be good. We know it's worth waiting for. But you don't get a lot of offerings talking about the future because it, there's nothing, everything's over there. But when you start focusing people on nearsighted right now and we get focused on these things and you start teaching people about how to have their better life now, and I'm not trying to be, make fun of anybody here, but the false teachers are going to get focused on what they're looking at, which is what? The world, which is the corruption of the world. We're trying to be delivered from the corruption of the world. We're trying to do a good job here, live a productive life, but we're going somewhere. They are blind. If you're not increasing in these things, then you're blind to this, and you're nearsighted, which means you can't see far off, but you can focus on things that are close. And I think, that's, I think it's very plain. I think it's, like, you can think about it. Try, people try to explain it different ways. But if you are not increasing, if you have been born again, and you have a chance to learn the word and grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, you will begin to add to your nature the divine nature. You'll become more Christ-like. But if you are not doing this, then the alternative is you're blind to this value. You, you can't see it. And you're going to focus on something. And you're going to focus on something more temporary. 
something that seems more important right now. And so we read the verse 9 again. But if anyone does not have them, an increasing, uh, 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 increasing in these, care, these virtues, he is nearsighted and blind in the NIV. He should be, I think, as, as the Greek, blind and nearsighted. Does anybody want to say anything about that, about the translation? Anyone want to, I mean, not to argue, but I mean, does anybody f feel it's bad that, you know, I've, I've challenged that, that, you know, and showed you the Greek in the, in the, in the yes, ma'am? It's not to challenge you, but if you're blind, if something is far or near, it doesn't matter, you don't see it. Right. And th that's a good point. And that's what I was saying last week, was this blind, I think it makes more sense what I said tonight, but the blind, I kind of going with that idea last week, was was you, you're completely insensitive to the light, which means you aren't born again, you have never responded to God, and that would, in, in what I was trying to point out, was that might be the false teachers of chapter 2, because in chapter 2, when we get to chapter 2, there are people that are going to be condemned in chapter 2. They, their destruction is waiting. They're not going to just fail in earth, they're going to fail in eternity. And so you've got to do something with those people in chapter 2. Are they believers who've lost their salvation, or are they the blind, and it's really what, what, what is, who's being condemned in chapter 2 are the false teachers. They're the leaders standing up front who are leading people astray. Now, I was saying last week, I'm still open to that idea, that these blind are the false teachers standing in front misleading people because they don't really understand. They don't even, they don't have no, it's going to say in chapter 2, they have no qualms with feasting with the believers because they really don't understand the importance. They see, for example, they'll look at Bible teaching as like how's that any how's that important why does anyone even care about this because they can't see the value of it so this is the false teachers potentially that are they've never been saved and they're misleading who the born again believers and getting them nearsighted instead of far sighted hopefully bible teaching and, and good church ministries are taking people and getting them so they're looking beyond today they're looking somewhere else and bad ministries are getting people focused on the near. Now, that does not mean that if someone's in, a, in feeding the homeless, that is a nearsighted ministry, okay? I mean, we're talking about your life, trying to solve all your problems in your life right now so I have a happy life now. Nothing wrong with, you know, getting a good education, going to the doctor, taking care of your problems, and trying to live a good life now. But that, that's really, understand, that's really not our focus. Our focus is to grow in the, in the nature or the understanding of Jesus Christ. So I think blind... Like what, what Sinai was saying, that could that that gives the impression you have no sight at all. You've never been illuminated to light, and so that would be potentially the false teachers. That doesn't make sense. And that's probably one of the reasons why they flip these. So it's more of a prog pro progression. The, the modern translators are probably struggling with that. So if you're nearsighted today, your eyesight is failing, and you'll eventually become blind, which leads into slipping away and losing your salvation. But that's not what the Greek doesn't have it in that order. It's got blind and nearsighted. Going back to what I was trying to say tonight, this blind is maybe a reference to blind, especially with nearsighted coming after, blind to the far off things. They are blind, not like, like in physical, if you're blind physically, it doesn't matter what it is. But in this illustration, they're blind to the eternal things, but they're focused. They can see clearly on the nearsighted things. So that would be, you know, that would be another way of looking at it. But that's a good, that's a good, because Peter's making a big deal about it. Uh, some other commentators said on a couple places here, Paul seems, Peter seems to write kind of almost rhythmically, like there's a, a pattern, almost like he's quoting lyrics or something, and it's where they are, they're kind of a, a, a rhythmic uh, writing in the Greek, but yet it doesn't have real clear sense, which kind of some people say he may be quoting a, a, a contemporary saying at the time, like Paul often quotes slogans or, or mottos in 1 Corinthians. He says, you say this. So some of these sayings may come out of, you know, a popular song or something that the people are familiar with. Any other comments about that? But do know, uh, you know, in your Bibles it does appear one way and there may be a good reason for it, but in the Greek it's pretty much said it's the other way around. Anything else? Anybody else want to say anything about that? Okay. Uh, so verse 9. But if anyone doesn't have them, uh, an increasing in the divine nature of growing in these virtues, he doesn't have them, he is nearsighted and blind, or blind and nearsighted. And here's him, now we go on. And has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Now if you go down on, on that first page, 
uh, the word for God is like the third paragraph or a line from the Bible. Forgotten, it can only mean, in the Greek, forgotten can only mean, in a sense, of intentionally forgetting something. He is neglecting something. They have now, if they are, if they are not growing, if a person, again, these are Christians, and if the Christian is not growing, then they have intentionally, on purpose of their own free will, now we're not attacking grace, but we, but at the same time, we are adding to this grace, now be careful as I say this, I, 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 you agree with this, it's going to be hard to say without making it sound like heresy, we are saved by grace, but there now does come, and Peter, I think it's very clear here, there is now this human effort. All the way through here, these are explicit, are, are imperatives. You need to grow. You have been saved. You have the divine nature. Now you need to experience it. You need to participate in it. You need to put forth some effort. So again, we're not talking about earning salvation. I don't think we're talking about keeping salvation. Again, that, that's another discussion. I think we're talking about being productive with the salvation you have been given. So, when he says this right here, uh, but if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten, and that would be an intentional forgetting, that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Cleansed from sin. Cleansed from his past. So, intentionally forgetting, the opposite would be, Instead of intentionally forgetting, you'd be intentionally staying focused. You've got this grace, you've got the salvation, you stay focused on it and, and realize that you have been cleansed of your past sins. Now, what does this refer to? Uh, as you look on your notes right there, the word cleansing, I've got it written there, it's fourth paragraph from the bottom. It refers to the cleansing of salvation most likely. You've been cleansed of your sin. And there's two points right here we're going to point out that this can refer to. The born-again experience where you accept Christ when you, by faith, you enter into the body of Christ. You have been cleansed of your sins positionally. There is also this other concept, and it's going to come up later on in the book also, and this is not far-fetched. It's baptism. It's just a ritual. Again, Peter doesn't go any further than ritual. He doesn't even call it the symbolism of this. Now, in the New Testament, when were people baptized in the New Testament? Just do a quick file, run through the files in your mind. Day of Pentecost, they heard the message, and they, what was the first thing that happened to them? They were baptized. Uh, Cornelius' house, they heard the message, they believed. He the Spirit came, they spoke in tongues, and they were baptized. The Philippian jailer, he was and his family were baptized. They didn't go to catechism. They didn't have to have all the doctors explained. They didn't understand necessarily the virgin birth, or are you, uh, you know, Armenian, are you Calvin, what are you? It's like... I mean, all those things, they were not indoctrinated first. Now, within the first hundred years or so, baptism is not, and this, any good organization is going to do this. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? If someone's going to, I had some way of joining the generation word ministry, you know, it should be as simple as, I, I'm going to join, I'll be at Bible study. Okay, but as soon as we put structure in, what is going to be required for membership? You need to know our core values. And then I'm going to, I'm going to have a, a membership class. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but that's natural tendency of once you get a, an organization instituted or incorporated, it's like, you want to join our ministry? Well, we want to prepare you for the ministry. So here's our classes. And with the same thing happened in the church. Is, is it not true? Would you agree in the, in the New Testament it appears that people are hearing the message and being baptized almost instantly? They were taught. I mean, Peter's talking about teaching. But they came to faith, and baptism was not a symbol of membership Bapti uh, in the church or the organization. Baptism was a symbol of the cleansing that had taken place. It was symbolic of this act. So it kind of almost matches the new birth experience. Now, there's a, now once, you start, once you say the word baptism, there hasn't been anything more divisive in church history than baptism. So leave it as it is. <laughs> but I, I, I'm going to present that baptism was almost the same time as being born again. It wasn't that came later. Within the first hundred years, though, it's going to become, you're going to have to go through catechism. And they'd have to be prepared, and they'd, they'd have to wear white gowns and stuff and go through the rituals of being baptized. You had to be prepared. Even the disciples of the apostles were putting people in catechism classes before they would allow them to be baptized, which isn't bad because I, as we read this, we're going to find out that this is a, a covenant. How do you spell covenant here? Covenant. It's a contract. It's an agreement that it's this new birth experience is it's the new covenant. It's got two sides to it. Jesus Christ has done this for you. You're saved by grace. 
but by entering into that covenant, you, you, you're kind of agreeing that you're forsaking the world, you're forsaking your past sins, and you're not just getting saved so I don't have to go to hell. You're accepting Christ. You want to be conformed into his image. So in this contract, I think, and I think this is going to help explain some verse that Peter's going to talk about. In this born-again contract, you're not just escaping the fires of hell. You're rejecting who you are. You're rejecting your sins. You're rejecting your worldly nature. And you're saying, save me. Not just save me from hell so I can go to heaven, but save me from this corrupt nature. Transform me. And that's part of this contract. Jesus is saving you, and your expected, expected re response is to participate in the transformation, which comes back to human effort. He saved you, and you have agreed through baptism. You know, that'd be your ritual. That'd be the ceremony. Do you want to get saved? I want to get saved. Baptized. You've been cleansed from your past sins. You are free now to grow in Christ. And that's being said of the expectation that you're actually going to do it. And when it says that they have forgotten... They have forgotten that they've been cleansed of their past sins. This may be a reference to the fact that they've forgotten. Now, they haven't forgotten that they're saved. They haven't necessarily forgotten that they've accepted Christ. Because most people do. It's like, oh yeah, I accepted Christ back in 84. It's like, and what happened? Well, you know, I've kind of slipped away since then. Well, it doesn't mean you forgot that you accepted Christ. It means you've forgotten this baptismal covenant. You've forgotten that you've been cleansed. And in this washing away of your sins, when you came out of the water, you were resurrected to a new life. You've walked away from the old man. You are now in Christ and ready to grow. Yeah, I, I, I'm not really interested in that. You've intentionally forgotten. You've got a covenant. Now understand, it's not the Mosaic covenant. Again, within here, there's room at any time, as you can see this kind of developing, <coughs> There's room at any time here where you can all of a sudden move into that losing your salvation. This is a great book to go to, to to teach you've lost your salvation or people can lose their salvation. I'm not ready to go there yet. I think people are saved by grace and now comes the human effort. Are they going to grow in that? You're not going to lose your salvation. And this right here, if people are not growing in these virtues, they have intentionally forgotten that they've got, they're in a covenant. And this covenant is not... You're saved, do what you want to. This covenant is you're saved and delivered from your past sins. Now grow in the grace of God. And, ah, uh, yeah, we forgot that part. We, did, Larry, did you want to say something? Well, I don't want to get off target here, but I'm wrestling with this. You mentioned it earlier. Productive life. And you know what you said in here? Unproductive in your knowledge. Does he really go in to say, define what is the productive life? Yes, growing in knowledge become more like Christ. But is there more definition of what, um, if what is the productive life? You can look at those two words right there. It'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think as we look at this, this is talking, first it's talking about the internal values, the, right, you know, goodness and, and knowledge and self-control and perseverance, but then eventually it's going to be godliness, brotherly kindness, which is directed towards those within the church. We talk about brotherly kindness was those in a fraternity, not the world, but those that you, you're cooperating with the other members of the body of Christ, and then eventually love, which is agape, which is now we're reaching out. I'm not just cooperating with my brothers. I'm reaching out. And again, that's going to manifest in a variety of things, but it's coming from the inside. The first thing you've got to do is have that nature. So the knowledge is going to help you build the perseverance. It's going to help you build the godliness and these characteristic traits that will obviously, then, like you're asking, would be reaching out and being productive in some way. Now, Peter then says in verse 8, will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. There's... there's this, without the true knowledge, and, and eventually I'm going to talk about a few things about what that knowledge is. It's, it's the apostolic knowledge. It's the, it's the revelation, the faith that uh, Jude calls it, the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. This is the information. It is divine knowledge. It is divine information about who Jesus is, what the plan is, who you are in Christ, and, and the power for it to grow. If, if you do not increase in this character traits, if you do not grow in this knowledge, you can still be, in a sense, religious. You can still be a church member. You can still try to be a good guy. But the thing is, you're going to end up being these things right here. You're going to end up being ineffective and unproductive. Again, and who's judging? Here's maybe your question. 
now you look in the mirror or you step out in public is here's Larry. Is he effective and is he, is he productive? And this is, this is that slippery slope right here because Jesus made the statement, and again, I'm, I'm grabbing verses, so be careful. Whenever someone starts grabbing verses, you can grab whatever verse you want, say whatever you want. The more you know, the more you can grab verses. But Jesus did say, the first will be last, and the last will be first. There's a day of reversing things. And that doesn't necessarily mean that if you're poor here on earth, you're going to be wealthy in heaven. But if you're wealthy in heaven, you're going to be poor in eternity. It's not that kind of reversal. You know what I'm saying? If you're tall on earth, you're going to be short in heaven. It's not, just, it's not that. It's going to be the scales of judgment are reversed. What we thought, what the world thought was valuable, and we called them effective and productive, God is going to say, yeah, that's not so effective. I'll say this as an illustration potentially. Maybe I'm rambling and not getting to your question. But I, it's hard, but it does help me when I read this. For example, you think of somebody, uh, a, a famous author, a famous speaker, someone that's very influential. Maybe they've got books on the shelf, you know, how to be a, a productive person. and You know, the self-help aisle at Barnes & Noble. And here's all these, you know, every self-help book's got a picture of a person on it. It's like, you can be like me. You know, none of them look like me. But it's like, you know, they, they all are, they're looking like, wow, you know. And it's like, and they may have sold 10 million copies. And again, I, I don't regret it. I would like to sell 10 million copies. I would, if I had a chance, I would go for it. But the world may flock to hear them speak. They, they may say, this person is successful. Their obituary may read like, what a great person. They influenced so many people. Yeah, but it really was ineffective and unproductive. It was all, all it was, and again, not diminishing them. I, I've erased my diagram here. But they were just focusing on the temporary. It's like they became more and more powerful in this, in this world. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's not being, you may consider, the world may consider it effective, the world may consider it productive, but if you will grow in this knowledge, it will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive, not as though, here's what I'm trying to say. This is not Peter saying, the world will watch, watch, they'll see Larry walk into the grocery store and say, there's a highly effective and productive person. And when they say that, it's kind of like, that's when you need to be a worry because they're judging you on, on their human standard. Peter's not using this human standard. He's saying, as we continue reading, that you're going to enter into eternity. The veil's going to be pulled back, and now the evaluation. Have you grown in these character traits? And again, there should be some product. We should be able to see fruit and, and stuff in your life. But you've got to be so careful, I think, about evaluating yourself based on the worldly standard. And we all go through that. We all go through you. I, I, I look at it like, man, you know. And uh, oh, even one of my sons sometimes will, will, will talk to me. There's one in particular son. He's very encouraging. He's a great son. Uh, I'm very proud of him. But it's like, Dad, you could be doing so much more. It's kind of like, yeah, but I don't want to do so much more. But we could, it's like, there are certain values in life that I'm going to hold on to. And, it, you know, but if you would, it's like, not going to go there. I'm not going to be, you know, not that that's wrong, but it's like, one, I've tried a lot of things already, so I'm, I like having my feet on the ground. But it's like, he would look at me and says, yeah, you're doing a good job, but you could be so much more effective and more productive. And it's like, well, let's wait until you're 45, 50, and then you tell me what you think. Uh, well, you've always said it's the judgment when you get, you want to hear. Right. Good, right. well done, faithful right. servant. If right. I was afraid. So that would be the exactly. productive. Right. You want to be productive for what he wants us to be productive. Right. It's just getting there. You know, and it's going to be anything. You spend a lot of time in your life doing things that were maybe worldly production, but that'll probably burn up. I mean, you know. And then we got to be careful there too, because you know he made us men. He made us. You know, he says you'll work the ground, you'll have a job. I mean, you can't just. I, I sometimes consider the like the people that walked away from from life and went to the monasteries. And again, not to make fun of anybody here, different people are called it. But just because you walk away from wealth and you walk away from the world and you're going to go out here and live in the desert, it's like, look at me. I have nothing of the world. It's like, that's really not what God intended when he says, but man in the garden, he says, work the garden and be productive. I mean, there, there is, he's called us all to be productive in this. The, 
a lot of times, and this comes from when we talk about Gnosticism or Gnostic teaching, you know, that knowledge, that secret knowledge. This comes from Gnostic teaching. It, it infiltrates Christianity yet today. Is the world is evil and the, the spiritual is, is where you want to be. It's like, wait a minute. The same, and the Gnostics are going to have two gods. The God who created the world was the Old Testament bad God, and Jesus was the good God who's going to lead us into righteousness and lead us away into light away from this wicked world. Well, see, my Bible has the same God who created this world that's got problems because of sin, but he's created me for this world to be productive, to take care of my garden and be productive. So there is this place of being naturally productive that God is going to hold us accountable for. I mean, if you don't take care of your family, you don't go to work, you're irresponsible, it's like, that's hardly Jesus. That's hardly Paul and Peter. These guys were high. Name David. I mean, name these guys. I mean, these guys were productive people. So there is a place in this. So you can't draw the line, well, I need to be more spiritual. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now you've watched too many religious movies or something. It's like, what is spiritual? Well, 1 Corinthians tells us what's spiritual. Spiritual is, he's in, and we talk about this in church on Sundays, chapter 12, 13, 40, 1 Corinthians. The spiritual man is not the man who's mystical, emotional, has all these spiritual gifts, because Paul says everyone has a spiritual gift. The spiritual man is the one who can use those gifts in love. Without, without love, without agape, it, is, it, Paul says, if you, if you allow me to go to 1 Corinthians 13, if you, do not, if you use these gifts and you do not have love, you are not, well, let's, let's do that. Let's, I'm sorry, I, I hope you don't mind this. Because this is a good question. And don't, you know, be like the middle school kids going to beat Larry up at the end of the school day because he asked the question. Go <laughs> ahead. Bring it on. I'll show you how productive I am. Okay, chapter 13, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians. And now, first of all, right, first, let's forget about weddings. Get, 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 let's, I mean, just kind of erase all of your experience with chapter 13, and let's read it for the first time. And then what he's doing is, Paul is trying to describe for the people, explain to them who the spiritual man is. And they think they're spiritual because, or the here. They think they're effective, or they think they're highly productive. They think they're highly spiritual because they're manifesting some kind of spiritual gift. If it be prophesying, speaking in tongues, whatever the coolest gift is, look at me, I'm being mystical, I'm being magical, I'm being spiritual. And Paul's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Now understand, I don't think anywhere in here Paul is throwing the spiritual gifts under the bus. Because chapter, chapter 12 ends with this, chapter 12 verse 31 ends, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. So he's saying, desire the greater gifts, but then he says, and now I'll show you the most excellent way. Chapter 13, or excuse me, chapter 14 begins after chapter 13 ends. He says, he sums it up, follow the way of love, chapter 14, verse 1, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. So you can run over there to chapter 12 if you want to and say, but eagerly desire the greater gifts, and now whatever church you're in, you're going to list the greater gifts over here, and all the gifts that are causing you trouble or you're doctrinally against, you're going to list the minor gifts over here. Tongues usually ends up over here on this list. Uh, who cares about that? Here's the gift we're really interested in, the gift of pastor, because that's what I am. I'm a pastor. Or whatever. The, you know, These are the greater gifts. But now you go to chapter 14. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. He doesn't say the greater spiritual gifts. He says spiritual gifts especially the gift of prophecy. Oh my goodness, and now you're gonna to have to jump and do some loops around that somehow because what is prophecy in context? It's, it's some kind of ecstatic speech or a revelation that you're, I mean, read it, and you're gonna to have to say, well, that's just a good sermon, that's a Bible teaching, that's passed away, whatever. Okay, so anyway, Paul's not throwing the spiritual gifts under the bus, but the Corinthians think they're spiritual, they think they're productive because look, I've got a spiritual gift. Paul spends the entire chapter 12 basically saying over and over again, everybody's got a spiritual gift. Everybody, we all have a part, we each have it. But, chapter 13, and now I'll show you the most excellent way. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, I, 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 I am producing nothing. If I do not have love with my spiritual gift, I am producing nothing. People may be applauding, they may be impressed, but I have produced nothing. 
If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and have all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So the first thing he says, you have without love, you have produced nothing. Okay? Now, if you move mountains with your faith, and you now these are all gifts, people, what are you going to do with these gifts? Okay? Uh, he says, but without love, I am nothing. Uh, in other words, what we say, I'll just write character. If you don't have love, doesn't matter how great your gift is, you are nothing. You have produced nothing without love. You are nothing without love. Yes, but watch this. Verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor, if I surrender my body to the flames, martyrdom for the sake of Christ, but have not love, I gain nothing. Gain nothing where? Rewards, eternal rewards. So in other words, if you've got, and he's, he's named, I mean, he's giving you a, almost a, a comprehensive list of gifts from tongues and a static speech to the common gifts all the way to the gifts of giving away your money and dying in the flames for Christ. He's covered the whole, Paul's leaving no area untouched here. He says, if you don't have love, no matter what you do, if you are not doing it from that divine nature that Peter's, that Peter's describing there, you have produced nothing for this world. You have not got any character. You are nothing. You are not Christ-like. And you get nothing in eternity. So understand, if people are rocking the world with their spiritual gift, this is what I was trying to say earlier, if people are on the front of book covers, if they're rocking the world and everybody knows their name because of their spiritual gift or whatever kind of character or uh, quality they brought to the earth, if they are not doing it with the divine nature, not just being saved, but they've grown and are increasing in this nature of, uh, of, of, of patience, of, of hupomone, of, of brotherly kindness, of love, they have produced nothing of value in the earth. They have not got any character. They may have a great smile. They may have cameras and lights on. They may have a makeup artist behind the, on the podium. And I've, you ever seen that? You ever seen the pastor's makeup melt? In Tulsa, I saw, I saw pastors... We get up close, and their makeup was melting because of the heat of the lights for a church service. Yeah, try that. My make, if I got something on my face, it's sawdust. Okay? <laughs> Produce your character. You don't have the character, and your rewards in heaven. It's like you're going to enter heaven. It's kind of like, yeah, there's nothing here. First Corinthians, they'll pass through the fire. They themselves will be saved, but everything else will be burned up. They'll, they'll, they'll escape through the flames. Well, welcome to heaven. What would you bring? Nothing. But I was, everybody had my books. It's like, right, you produced nothing, you did not conform to the image of Christ, and we've got nothing to give you. So, now, with that being said, uh, you've got it almost, again, without giving you some kind of loophole to escape, and Mary's hoping I don't give you a loophole. It's like, she's saying, that's what we want to see, Larry, more agape at home. But it's like, everyone's called to something. You can't compare apples and oranges. You can't compare Paul with John Mark. You can't compare Barnabas with Peter. You can't, you can't mix and match these people. They are called to a specific thing. And I'm going to be evaluated on what God has put in my heart, what God has revealed to me, what, and I've got to find it. I've got to be responsible. And it doesn't have to be a, a worldwide ministry. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to incorporate and start a ministry to be successful in God's eyes. What has he called you to do? Uh, the great example is, is David. Uh, when, when the men went off into battle to pursue the Amalekites, remember they came out after Mount Gilboa, they came back and, 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 and uh, uh, what's a uh, Ziklag was burnt to the ground and they went after the Amalekites and some of the men couldn't go because they, they traveled all the way from Mount Gilboa and they came down they, and they, they lost everything. Some of the men were just exhausted so they stayed back. They said, well, let's just leave all of our stuff here with these men and let's go pursue the Amalekites. So they traveled light and fast. They overcame the Amalekites, destroyed them, brought all the families back and all the plunder back, and these men were staying and guarding the stuff. The men who went with David, you know what they did. They came back and says, these guys, they're not worthy. We went out and fought the battle. These guys just sat here and just watched our luggage. David says, no, the men who stay with the stuff get the same reward as those who went out on the front lines. And that became a, that it says right there, it became a precedent in Israel. That was how they treated people. Everyone's got the same part, get the same reward for the job that was accomplished. Not that everything, you know, that's another whole conversation of equality of rewards. But if you're called to stay with the stuff, the guy out there fighting on the front lines of the battle can't look back and say, you're not part of this team because you didn't come out here. It's like, well, if the God's called you to stay with the stuff or if God's called you to go off with David, whatever, 
that's what you've got to do. He'll say, well done, a good and faithful servant. I mean, I do worry about. I do worry about because I've got certain things in my mind, certain things I've got goals for that I'm trying to get accomplished. I feel strong calling to teach the Word of God. But like I said before, I, I hope that someday I'll, I'll stand before Jesus Christ and he'll say, well done, the good and faithful servant. But sometimes I think he's going to look at me and be like, I'm sorry, what were you thinking? I mean, <laughs> I know oh, you worked so hard, but that wasn't even close. Now, I definitely know that when I was playing guitar and writing music. It's like, I know that's, it's like, that's going to be the, yeah, those, this block of time right here, I guess we can give him credit for growth or something, but it's like that was that was unproductive and, and highly ineffective. And and hopefully now we've moved up. But yeah, does that answer your question at all? I mean, I talked for a long time. <laughs> what was my question? <laughs> I know. Hey, that's the problem. You don't know how many times I'm gonna answer a question. I go and they're like the people are like NFL, yeah, it's like, oh, I don't even remember. I don't even remember asking a question. <laughs> yeah, you did last June. Remember when you asked the question? Started a whole series to answer your question. So I, I apologize, but that does. I mean, that kind of comes back to this verse right here. Uh, we're back in Second Peter, uh, verse eight. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, and do realize it does line up with what Paul says in First Corinthians, because he says, "Faith, hope, and love." And the greatest of these is love, because love produces hope. We see that earlier in First Corinthians thirteen, and love produces uh, faith or faithfulness. So love is going to be the, 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 the epitome of this, and it is in Peter's list also. For if you possess these qualities in increasingly increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. So if you are growing towards more love and more brotherly kindness, using the gifts and the callings God's given you, it's going to keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. But you take your eye off of God's calling, off of becoming more Christ-like, and say, look, I'm getting a bigger crowd if I do this. I'm being more, getting more attention if I do this. It's like, okay, you've just taken, you, you're just gone the way. And again, I mean, this leads into chapter two, Larry. What, what's it look like to go the other way? You take your eye off serving and loving and doing what Christ has called you to do to build up the body of Christ. You take your eye off the ball for a moment. You're looking here because where's the crowd? The crowd is still in the world. The, the, this is where there's... They're comfortable here. And if you want the, the audience, if you want the attention, you want the applause, that's why, that's why I can say the false teachers are down here and the false teachers maybe aren't even saved. I, there's a very good possibility that the false teachers of Second Peter and of Jude, they're not even Christians. It says they, they, judgment has been waiting for them. It's been stored up from the beginning. They were never saved. They never, they never came to the light, but they saw... The opportunity. I mean, you know, when people are looking for a, a, a help self help self help seminar, this guy, I'm there. I've got a smiling face. I got charisma. I can talk to a group. Not me, but I mean, this whoever this false teacher. I might be the false teacher. It's like boom, and look at everybody's flocking to him. It's like this guy does not have the truth, but he's got the believers sitting in front of him taking notes on how to make their nearsighted life better. This guy's not saved, and these people right here. They're ineffective and unproductive in their knowledge of Jesus Christ. I don't know if that makes sense, but let's, let's go on right here. Uh, we're looking on page one of the notes. Again, uh, the cleansing could be is referring to some kind of salvation. I mean, not some kind of salvation, but some for, part of the salvation act. If it's faith in Christ, your sins have been positionally washed away. But it could also be referring to baptism. And that's going to come up later here again, which is a symbol symbol uh, and it is a covenant you're, you're entering with baptism you are entering into a covenant again it's the covenant of grace you're saved by grace but by coming into that covenant you are in a sense the very fact you accepted Christ you're saying I don't want to be like the world I want to be like G I want to be conformed like Jesus Christ and again I, I want to refer back to this it's a it's an attractive thing look over in verse 3 his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. And that remember we were reading through that. He calls us, it's like we saw His glory, we saw His goodness, and that's what attra it attracts us to Him. We see how great He is and who He is when it's correctly presented, and we are drawn to Him. He offers us salvation, now we're saved, and to turn our back on that glory and that goodness that we've got a chance to participate in and go back to the world, it's like, 
What were you thinking? And they have intentionally forgotten that glory and goodness and have returned to the world. So that's what this means right here. Verse 9, forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Verse 10, therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. Now, again, keeping in mind that ideal of a covenant, that they, the, the baptism was a covenant and they've intentionally forgotten their covenant, they've intentionally, they've, they've been cleansed of their past sins and they're in this forgiven state that they're free to grow, they forget that and walk away from it. Look in this right here, this verse, verse 10. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. Now, again, you can do a wide variety of things with these words, but let's start with the word sure. The word sure is in the middle of page two. It means sure, it means firm, it means to confirm. It is the word in the Greek, B-E-B-A-I-A-N, Babaian, Babian, Babian. And it is a legal term in Greek used to communicate the thought that a contract, a covenant, or an agreement was valid, verified, or confirmed. In other words, especially when you read those back to back, verse 9, they, they've forgotten that they've been sank, washed, uh, washed, cleansed of their past sins, or they've forgotten about their baptismal covenant. And now he says instead, verse 10, my brothers, you be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. And that you don't lose sight of that word sure. It means confirm your covenant. And what was your covenant? I've been saved by divine grace. I've been given the divine life. And I'm now going to grow in that. I'm going to respond to that by growing. I don't think your salvation is based on your growing in it. But it's your opportunity. And you've come into this covenant. And make that covenant secure. Confirm it by showing us grow in these things instead of going forgetting about growing and going back to the world make your calling and election sure he has called you he has elected you he has given his divine life so how are you going to what are you going to do for what are you going to show us you're going to confirm that you're in that covenant by growing do you understand kind of what i'm saying you got to be kind of light on that because this is one of those verses where john kelvin i think just fell, falls flat on his face do what you want to with it but right here, what he is going to say is if you are called, if you are elected, if you're of the chosen few, you will then have the fruits of righteousness. And that is why that you've got a group of people that are going to go out of their way to prove, look at me, I'm, I've got the fruits of righteousness. And they're going to, whatever that their community thinks is the fruits of righteousness, they're going to act, look, smell, dress like they're supposed to. And why are you dressing like that? I want to make sure everyone knows I'm saved. I mean, now you've, just, now you've taken your eye off the ball again. Now you're into some form of legalism of trying to prove that you're one of the saved. And how, how terrible it is for the person who, who doesn't conform and doesn't have the signs of that culture of being conformed in the image of Christ, which is not really being conformed in the image of Christ. It's being conformed in the image of their church doctrine of this is how we sit, this is how we dress, this is what we eat, this is what we drink, this is what we don't drink, this is what we dance to, this is what we don't dance to. I've got all the signs of a saved believer. In what year? 1561, 1782, 2000. It's like, so John Kelvin falls all over his, and again, you can do what you want to with that. Uh, but yet, yet it's saying here, but if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins, that he's forgotten that he's got a, the new, that he's in the new covenant and is supposed to be growing. He's intentionally forgotten that he's supposed to grow. Therefore, my brothers, instead of doing that in contrast to forgetting that you're in a covenant, that you're supposed to be growing, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. Be all the more eager to confirm the covenant. Get into that covenant. And here it is and in, in the imperative. Go back up to that word where it says, uh, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager. And we're going to go right back to, uh, I've got a word uh, right underneath verse 10 where you got the Greek written out. You go, Therefore is the word in the Greek deal. And it means, instead of not showing signs of knowledge, growth, and goodness, Begin to demonstrate your knowledge, growth, and goodness. So instead of going the way of the, the, the false teachers are leading people, instead, you show your knowledge. You show your growth. You show your godliness. And not in a hypocritical, pharisaic, uh, legalistic way, look how righteous I am, but go ahead and use that knowledge to make decisions in life to demonstrate growth and godliness. Now, Peter encourages his readers to, here's the word right now, the next line is spodaste. Spodasate, which is translated 
some places, hurry, up above in your Greek it's translated hurry, or translated be all the more diligent, and this is, if you remember the word, he calls the word in chapter 1, verse 5, Peter used the word spoden, which is, means make every effort, it, is, uh, it means all diligence, it refers to quick movement, making haste with zeal, and it is done in the interest of the person. So what he says in chapter 1, verse 5, and we spent some time talking about this, look in chapter 1, verse 5 of 2 Peter, for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith. In other words, for this reason, be haste, make, be quick about it. Don't hold anything back, but tr start growing in these things. And it is in the imperative. It's not you're waiting for God to do it. Make every effort. Now, this is the same word, a different form. Now, instead of neglecting your baptismal covenant that you've been cleansed from your sins and are free to grow in Christ, instead, be all the more eager. The same word, spoden, a different form of that word. Now, be more eager, hurry, make haste to start doing these things. In other words, now that you've got this idea, instead of forsaking your covenant, get in there and start growing and using the knowledge and the growth to produce godliness and get after it. Make, make, your, make your covenant secure. And again, it's not about making a, that's a bad word, secure. I think you are secure, but confirm. Do your part of the, I'll say this way, do your part of the deal. Christ saved you, now you start growing. He can save you, but he's not going to cause you to grow. Now that's, that's touchy right there. Now you can disagree with that if you want to. Because some people think he saved you by grace, he causes you to grow by grace. It's all grace, all an opportunity has been given to us, but I think at some point there is that human effort of I am going to embrace this grace and start doing something with it. Uh, and I think Peter's saying that too. Uh, does anyone want to say something? I'm going to move on. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager, spoden, a form of the word spoden, make haste, make every effort, to make your calling and election sure, again, sure being the, you know, confirm the covenant. For if you do these things, you will never fall. Again, there, you'll never fall. What does never falling mean? Does that mean never sin? And that can't mean never sin, because Peter himself, sin. Uh, make your, uh, for if you do these things, you will never fall, and you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think that reference to never fall, and I've got that written down there, is a reference to falling here. If you continue to focus on growing and developing, you will never sin? No, that's not, that's not New Testament Bible. You are, Peter sinned. Peter talks about sin. John says in 1 John, if anyone says he has not no sin, he's a liar. We are all dealing with sin. We, we will not be delivered from sin until we're delivered from this world. But we can avoid falling into this camp down here, what we call apostasy. You can avoid falling into the nearsighted camp because if you keep growing in this direction towards Jesus Christ and the divine nature, you've got your eye and you'll continue to grow this way. But if you don't, you will fall into this camp. You become nearsighted. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. Confirm the covenant by growing in this grace. For if you do these things, you will never fall into apostasy like chapter 2 is going to be. And, and because you've never fallen into apostasy, you've lived in a, a productive life. You've continued to increase your, your patience, your endurance, your, your godliness. You will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I've got two things I want to say about verse 11, and then I'm going to have to wrap, I should wrap it up right now. I'll say them real quick, and I'll quit. Number one, I think if you look on, yeah, look on, you don't have these on your notes yet, because I've got it, I'll put them online. I'll, I'll, they'll be on next week's notes. The entrance into the kingdom can be considered to be the focus and not merely the attainment of a rich entrance. Now, what I'm saying there is the NIV may take some liberties here to help accommodate some doctrine. And you, and I'm reading from this, you guys tell me what your Bible say, and you will receive, the NIV says, a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom. Notice right there, a rich welcome, a rich entrance. It's as if in the NIV, like I'm teaching, your entrance is secure. You are going to go into the kingdom. But if it's rich or not is being determined by your actions. In the Greek, some of the commentators are pointing out 
That is not the issue. The issue is not rich entrance or poor entrance. The in emphasis is on entrance or no entrance, which now, I mean, it stuns me. Now I've got to go back. Okay, that's that. That you know, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. It doesn't necessarily mean it can mean if you fail to do this, there may no, there may not even be an entrance into the kingdom. And what the, the entrance is, there's three ways of looking at entrance. Is one, being born again into the, the kingdom of God. I don't think that's what we're talking about here because they're already participating in the divine nature. You can talk about dying and going into the kingdom. I don't think it's talking about that. I think this is talking about an eschatological event. And then we say the word kingdom, which leads us into the rest of this chapter. This is setting the stage for the rest of the chapter. The introduction of the concept, again, eternal kingdom. Because when we start in verse 12, we're going to start talking about the coming of that kingdom. And this is going to be a, one of the big points of this book. Besides this book being used for uh, uh, eternal salvation issues, false teachers, one of the things this book is used for is the kingdom of Jesus Christ or the coming kingdom. And he's going to talk about seeing that kingdom manifest. I'm going to try to say this very quickly. He's going, to start, he's going to talk about seeing the glory of, the, of, of Jesus Christ before he went to the cross on the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, we saw what it will look like. It lines up with the prophecies that the Messiah will be the, the king, the glorious king. And we stood there and we watched it happen. He appeared in glory. And it's like, this is what he'll look like when he returns. And then it stopped and they went to Jerusalem and he was crucified. But the image that Peter has in his mind is Jesus is going to be is being crucified, but this Jesus is coming back. How do you know? Two ways. One, the prophets have said so. And two, I stood on that mountain and God says, this is the one and this is what he'll look like when he comes back. He won't look like the suffering servant on the cross. He'll look like this. So we've introduced the concept of the kingdom and one of the things the false teachers have to get away from, you have to get away from this if you're going to have a successful ministry in this, in this false world of, of false teaching. You've got to get away from, in a sense, focusing on Jesus Christ and his kingdom in the future. You've got to move it up to today. You've got to focus on right now because Jesus Christ, is, in one sense, is, is to Peter says, he's waiting, he will be back. He will establish his kingdom. The false teachers are going to deny the Lord. They're going to deny his second coming. Things go on. This is the best it ever gets. This is the, the world is always going to be just like this. Get your part of it now. And Peter says, no. No. He says, that kingdom is coming. That's kind of where he wraps up chapter 2 before he goes into the chapter. He wraps up chapter 1 before he goes into chapter 2. Okay, we'll review that next week and talk about those things I try to throw at you real quick and try to clarify those. The issue is going to be the kingdom that is in the future that arrives when Jesus Christ comes back, the glorious King. I'll pray and then we're done. Thank you for taking time to be here. Father, we thank you again for your truth. We thank you for the things we have before us, the, the very truth that can help us keep our eyes set on eternity, set on things that are distant, and help us overcome the obstacles and the temptations and the, and the challenges at this time that we face that are, are the, the short-sighted goals. Father, we do ask that we'd have have clear guidance, that we'd have truth in our hearts. And Father, again, we ask that we may understand these things the way you intended. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for your time.